No, I was just lost. And then after she spoke, I had to leave. Oh, yes, that's all self One is not even there. Yeah, it's just a
but for your amazing, excellent Excel spreadsheets um, and your constant help. And also Beth, who is our site manager. Um, she is a transcriber and fellow Fanny lover. Um, and finally, to our Fanny researchers, um, who already know how special she is and want to share that with the rest of the world. Um, that's Diana Korsnick, Jeff Coates, and Nick Fazbane. So thank you to all of them as well. All right. So if Fanny is worth studying as an individual, not just the poet's wife, what can we learn about her trip abroad? Um, by comparing her world here in Boston to what she saw when she was in Europe, um, Fanny is starting to negotiate her ideas about family, about religion, um, about art, and also about where she fits in all of that. Um, let me show you what she looked like just about this time. This was a painting done a year before they took the trip. Um, so she's pretty young. She's, again, just 18. Um, she's a very well-educated, privileged daughter of a prominent Boston family, the Appletons. They're involved in the textile industry in Lowell. Sometimes she knows and is aware of that privilege, and other times, as you'll see, not so much. Um, she has grown up quickly, very recently, at this point in her life. Um, her mother, Maria, died three years before this trip, and her brother, Charles, died less than a month before they took this trip. Um, so she's got a bit of a solemn side, too, that you see reflected in her letters. She's very serious about her education and about her training. Um, she's extremely well-read. <coughs> And she, I believe she's a very talented artist. If you hadn't had a <coughs> chance yet to see some of her artwork that's on the wall, you'll see a lot more of it in the PowerPoint. Um, but also remember that she is um, a teenager. So at times, her romantic side kind of takes her away. Um, she can also complain. And she has been known to say some unkind things about the people she sees when she's traveling. Oh, just a little word there. Um, but this is going to be a very brief, extremely brief, overview of her trip um, in her own words as much as possible, with stories that I believe show how her character is developing. She's traveling with her family, so I'll introduce you to a few of them. This is her father, Nathan Appleton. Um, so he's the one who is involved in the textile industry. Um, they all live on, at 39 Beacon Street in downtown Boston. So right on the Boston Common. She also travels with her older brother, um, Thomas Gold Appleton. She's very fond of him. She admires him. At this point, he's 23, and he's actually traveled in Europe before. This is her sister, her best friend, Mary Appleton. Um, she's 22 at this point in time. And they also travel with two cousins, who I don't have pictures of, and I'm still getting to know. But they include William Sullivan Appleton and Isaac Appleton Jew Jewett. So if I say Jewett, it's referring to him. Um, and this is, in brief, the big places that they visited and that I will bring you through tonight. There could be a lot more markers on this map. So um, it's kind of the scope of the trip. All right, let's set sail. So on this voyage, we see Fanny and her sense of adventure, especially as she's traveling across the Atlantic, but also her curiosity. Um, November 16th, 1835 is when the Francis de Pau leaves New York Harbor, or tries to. Um, the wind is not on their side at that point in time, so they're actually stuck in the harbor. And that's when Fanny uses the time to draw what she sees. That's the first sketch we have of the trip. So this is the New York Harbor at the time, complete with a windmill here. You can see it. It's the mass of the ships. And she's added a little watercolor in it, so she's spending her time on this one. Um, she, on this, um, when she draws this, she says that it is their last link to American ground. Um, throughout the rest of this voyage, some of the highlights include seeing the Aurora Borealis for the first time. Um, they're off the coast of New, New Jersey when they see that, which I was amazed by. Um, but this is what she has to say about it. 
At half after ten, I was called upon deck to admire the most magnificent aurora borealis I ever saw. There were pillars of light shooting up from the sea, and gradually an arch of the deepest, most brilliant rose color glowed across the sky, relieving the sails with magical distinctness and making the bright stars dazzling as diamonds in a ruby ocean. This is one of those moments when her romantic side is really showing up. <laughs> um, she continues to sketch. But here's another one for you. Um, this is just, you know, a day on board. Um, she's got the flowers they received from their family members as a bon voyage here. Um, and these are the people that she's traveling with. They're reading. They're probably also sketching, things like that. Um, their days are filled with activities like this. She spends a lot of time with her siblings. They actually read the rhyme of the ancient mariner on one of their first days. Um, I don't know if that's ominous or not. <laughs> that's a good omen. Um, she watches the crew and the animals that are on board the ship as well. Um, and she takes time to learn nautical terms with a captain. Um, she also learns how to box a compass and to take longitude and latitude. And the captain says that she's an excellent student at this. Um, he also says that they will be, she and her sister, thought of as famous sailors, mentally and physically. <coughs> and the captain says, will doubtless someday command a ship in disguise. <laughs> um, their evenings are spent with polite dinner parties, playing games like whist. Um, they drink champagne almost every night. <laughs> um, in her most daring moment on this trip, one of the moments when I love her the most, she actually goes up top on the deck during a storm. She says she remained clinging to the topmost mast, awed, bewildered, till a monstrous wave broke over her head, drenching her to the skin. What an exulting thrill of fierce delight. To be baptized by such a priest at such an altar, a child of the tempest. Uh, her father quickly found her and told her to go back and change into dry clothing, but she was thrilled by this event. Um, and you can see sailing became a little more difficult for them. Um, this is a sketch that her brother Tom did, and she pasted it into her journal. Um, but there's a little pandemonium. People are falling down. The dogs are in the doorway here. <laughs> Someone back there is losing their, their step. Um, other people on this trip are experiencing seasickness, which she kind of euphemismly calls a mal de corps, which is sickness of the heart, but it means seasickness. Sea she will say until the end that she never had seasickness herself. Um, I'm not sure if that's true or not. <laughs> um, they began to place bets on when they would arrive, and their destination is La Havre, France. Um, Fanny's date is December 9th, between the hours of 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. Remember that. December 9th, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. 22 days of passage. They officially end the bets on December 6th. So that's when they first see land. It's not when they get off the ship, though. Um, that would be a voyage of 19 days. They're in the channel at this point in time and they can see their destination, but they haven't gotten off yet. Um, it also means that the captain won the bets. The first time that she sees France, this is what she writes down. What a fairy scene. The exquisite light green of the water, the towering rainbow colored cliffs, and the white lighthouses, and the dark sails of the myriad fishing boats all made a picture perfectly un-American. <laughs> They actually got off the ship and first touched land on December 9th in the afternoon. So I think Fanny should have won that bet. <laughs> they gave it to the captain, though. So by December 9th, oh, I forgot about this one. This is her little pencil drawing. Um, there's stick figures and a chandelier being swung about um, on their voyage. So by December 9th, um, they are in France. Um, France has been up until this point a fairy world to her, not a real place. Uh, but she fully indulges in the popular pastimes of a cultured, well-to-do young woman, um, shopping, and also being a patron of the arts. Um, in her exploration of 
the awful majesty of Gothic churches. Fanny mixes her appreciation of art with her growing spiritual beliefs. Um, she sees many um, different cathedrals, but this is one she's really impressed with in Rouen, France. So it's the Notre Dame Cathedral there. And she walks in here and is just dwarfed by what she sees. Um, when she left, she felt like there was a religiousness in matter. So the people who built this, literally reaching their hands to the sky to try to get closer to God. Um, so for her, this was kind of a religious experience. She stood in the spot where Joan of Arc perished, and she wrote, the heroine of the world. Here was the funeral pyre of the most inspired maid, whose wonderful courage and noble patriotism, coming from a woman, were thought nothing better than witchcraft and sorcery. She has proved, however, that even a weak woman can do something. They make their way to Paris. Um, and there's a lot to take in in this one. But this is something from our collection. Unless it says otherwise on the slide, all the things that you see actually come from the house. But there are small numbers identifying all these little sites. She would have been able to name them all. Um, the only one that I've been able to identify so far, you have Notre Dame Cathedral here, the one in Paris. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. If you know otherwise, let me know. Um, I think this is the Louvre. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the Tuileries. The Tuileries. The Tuileries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which would this make, that make this the, um, the palace? The what? The palace? Yeah. I know there's a palace near the, the Tuileries. As family, Fanny and her family are arriving, kind of in their carriage going up one of these big roads, she starts naming the things that she sees, because she's done so much research before they even got here. Um, so the things that she's calling out include the Bagne des Trois, um, the Madeleine, the Rue Rivoli, which is the road they're actually on as they go up, um, and the Tuileries, and the Louvre. Um, one of young Fanny's passions was art, and so you can imagine what sort of pleasure ground Paris was for her. Um, she appreciates art for itself, but also the act of drawing. Um, when she actually visited the Louvre, she saw a great many copyists at work, so people who were there sketching and studying themselves, <laughs> and she even noted that several of them were female. Was I not envious, she said. <laughs> Imagine, you know, what she's experienced. She spends at least half of most of her days in an art gallery. Um, and then lists all of the artwork that she saw. I'm still making my way through most of those lists. Um, during her time here, she would follow in her father's footsteps, who in Boston was a patron of the art. She also used his money to become a patron of the arts herself. Um, one of her favorite things at this point in time is the opera. Um, and this woman is someone that just inspires her. Um, this is um, Julia Greasy. Here she is portraying a character in Norma. And this is what Fanny has to say about the first time she saw her perform. I cannot attempt to describe the effect of that voice and her beauty and her grace, a tragic power. Um, afterwards, if you have some time to mill about, we've got other women that Fanny was inspired by. The more tragic, the more powerful they were on stage, the more inspired she is. Um, she also sits for a portrait with her sister. So in that sense, um, they're being a patron of the arts, they're actually paying for a portrait that still hangs in the house today. Um, it's in the dining room. So in this portrait, you've got her sister Mary, and then this one's Fanny here. Um, and the artist of this is Jean-Luc Baptiste Isabelle. Um, Fanny and her sister thought that he was a very charming old man. Um, Fanny says that he has gracious manners that come from a former age, um, because he's used to sitting at court and painting kings, and she gets to sit in front. Um, it will truly be an honor to be painted by him before whom so many crowned heads have sat. Um, their likenesses were taken in the studio. Um, they sent him clips of their hair afterwards, and 
he filled in the details, so like the dresses, the jewelry, the background that you see were done after they had left Paris. Their trip end up, ends up coming full circle, so when they get back to Paris, this portrait is hanging in the Louvre um, for a special exhibit, and they get to see themselves there. It's pretty cool for them, I imagine. Um, they would pass, so after leaving Paris, they hire two, or they buy two carriages. Nathan Appleton fills them with their crew. Um, and they also hire the services of two um, servants. So there's a male servant named Fran Francois, who goes with them through the rest of the trip, and then a woman named Adele, and she was the girl's maid. Let's see. In her final appraisal of France, I think I've got one more picture for you here of France. Oh, that's Italy. We'll get there in a second. <laughs> Fanny's final appraisal of France. The inns are good, its scenery occasionally fine, its donkeys funny, <laughs> its clocks plentiful and pretty, its people very respectable, good natured, quite enough folks, here she goes, without being either monkeys or har harlequins. Um, on Friday, January 22nd, their carriage left Paris, and Fanny said farewell with all its life and its majesty. She says to Paris, its splendor and its meanness, its comfort and its mud, faded in the distance, and we were once more fairly wandering on the face of the earth. And they made their way, it took a, a while, but they crossed the border into Italy. And they get there in February 1836. Um, when she writes in her journal, it's like, Italy! Exclamation point. She's very excited to get over the border. Um, she says, Bellissima Italia, on February 12, 1836. Italy is a place that nurtured her romantic, artistic side. Um, they stayed in Rome, in the Spanish, Spanish Piazza. Not sure exactly where. She doesn't write down the hotel. But she says that this was outside their window. Um, so if you've ever visited, kind of, those are the Spanish steps that you can walk up. So Rome was a highlight for Fanny. She calls it the Eternal City, um, and offered, it offered no end of galleries and art collections for her that were filled with the original works of the masters that she had been studying in Boston and copying before she traveled there. Um, so people like Guido Guer Guercino, or did I say that right? Guercino, there we go. Um, Titian, Raphael, Leonardo da Vinci. So in a similar romantic vein, one of the things that she was really looking forward to was seeing the Colosseum for the first time. But she refused to see it in daylight. She wanted to see it by moonlight first. Um, and there was another American family that was there that organized a trip for them to go. Um, and it didn't quite stack up to her romantic idea of what the experience should be. Um, and that's because the people that were with her were talking too much. <laughs> she wanted to sit there in the moonlight and kind of take it all in. Um, what she said of her experience was that her group made a drawing room of the Colosseum. Um, their pygmy voices sounded as <laughs> apes in a cathedral. Why are people so ashamed of feeling strongly and deeply, she says. Um, Fanny is also developing her own tastes in art at this point in time, and you can see it with, again, the list of artwork that she um, is admiring in really close detail. Um, she goes to the Vatican City, I don't have a picture of that, um, where she craned her neck upwards to look at Michelangelo's Last Judgment. Um, and she was awed by it, but she also bemoaned the fresco's decay and how dark it was at that point in time. Um, from there, they went to St. Peter's Basilica, where she heard Vesper's music. So this is an evening chant. Um, and she said that nothing breathed so, breathed so utterly within the reality of spiritual worlds as the, this divine music. So in one space she has music and art kind of blending with her new ideas about what her religious beliefs are. Um, that same group of Americans that she went to the Colosseum with um, were lucky enough to get a private tour of that, um, the Vatican, but they did it at night after hours by torchlight. It sounds like a lot of fun. Um, Fanny says, as the torches flashed by a long row of snow-silent statues, it lighted them into a life like no other. It had a most curious and ghostly effect. So 
for her, seeing these original artworks in person right in front of her was so much richer than studying them at home. And she said, what a world has dawned on me. Um, she's really taking it all in. When they leave Rome, they go to Florence. Um, this is her drawing of Florence. And it says, Ferenz, I can't quite see it, La Bella. <clears throat> um, in Florence, they saw the Palazzo Vecchio, Il Duomo, and the Campanile. Um, they also went to the Academy of Fine Arts, of course, any gallery that you go to, they went to. Um, and at this point, Fanny envies the boys that she see there, sees their drawing and sketching the artwork. Um, they were invited to a ball to meet the Grand Duke of Tuscany, um, she, who she refers to as your, His Highness, Leopold II. So at this point, um, Italy's not unified, so different regions have different leaders. Um, and she's invited to meet, essentially, the king of this region. Um, she was a bundle of nerves the afternoon leading up to this ball. Um, and really what happened is she and her sister and a few other guests stood in line, <coughs> walked down, nodded this head of people, curtsy, or she curtsied to him and he bowed, and then he went on. And after that point, she was free to enjoy the party, um, and she totally indulged. She had um, an excellent dinner, she describes that night, and she dances the night away. I think they're out till 1 a.m. for this one. They finally get back to their apartment. Um, Fanny is a big fan of balls at this point in her life, too. Um, they did waltzes um, all the way up until 1 a.m. Uh, also, while they were in Florence, she becomes a patron again, but this time of Lorenzo Bartolini. Uh, so you have a portrait of him here. I also put one of his other sculptures here. This is not Fanny. <laughs> but she sits with him to have a bust of her done. Um, she has no interest in having this done at first. Um, she writes down that her siblings, Mary and Tom, besieged me so desperately that as a matter of disinterestedness, I yielded. I have no wish for a marble immortalization, and two hours a day, I sigh to spare from Florence. She didn't want to give away that time so that she could be exploring the city. Um, but she does come to really enjoy her sessions uh, with Bartolini here. Uh, she says, he rubs the clay in his fingers and quite forgets his work. But I like his frankness in the conversation that they have. Um, they talk about things like Napoleon. He was, um, Napoleon was a patron of his. He actually did sculptures of Napoleon. Um, they talk about Byron and the romantic poets. And they actually have a conversation where Bartolini encourages American artists to come up with their own national form of artwork which I'm going to pause and talk about a little bit because it gets really important to who ends up living in this house later on. Um, Fanny writes down that he said, I wish young artists would never take up the antiques for models. I hope none of your sculptures, your sculptures will come abroad. Let them copy nature at home and form a national style. And she kind of scoffs at this. She writes down, I could not but laugh. What nature would they take? Indian nature? I told him the strict notions of people were utterly opposed to such things. So this is from a woman who would grow up and end up marrying Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And she becomes someone who pushes him as a poet um, with what he publishes. That same husband of hers would end up writing an epic poem in 1855 called The Song of Hiawatha, <laughs> which is about Native Americans. Um, in a sense, it's a fictional story. He does do a little bit of research, but um, both Fanny and Americans would come around in their tastes. This becomes his best seller, um, The Song of Hiawatha. So, we're not quite there yet. That's 1855. We're still in 1836. It's interesting to think about. So the bus that ends up being done of Fanny is this one here. If you've walked in the house before, it's still there. It's in the parlor room. So you can go see Fanny. It is kind of a romantic depiction of her, I think, but it's a beautiful one. Um, her summation of it. <laughs> Let's see, I have it in here. So at Bartolini does this bust, and Fanny says that he was a very nice man, but he makes me look solemn in clay. Um, which, you know, might 
suit her character at this point in her life. So at this point, one of the things that keeps cropping up in her journals are references to her cousin William and his health. Um, so by the end of May, they're beginning to become really worried about him, and Nathan Appleton actually sends for a physician. She writes that we are very anxious about William, so fond of fire and a cough still hanging on. So he's spending a lot of his days inside sitting by the fire with a cough. Um, the physician's opinion, he advised them to seek a mountain climate where he could get fresh air for William. So pretty much from that point on, they leave Florence and set out for Switzerland. It takes them a while to get there. Um, and Fanny is a little upset about leaving Italy. Um, I think she's struggling with not wanting to leave this place she's enjoying so well, but knowing William's not doing well. And the reason why their journey is changing is because of his health. Um, so she says, drink deep my soul. All these sights that thou mayst conjure them hereafter, I must believe I shall see this all again. Mm -hmm. So she says goodbye. Um, and they make their way to Switzerland. As they're going, they pass through places like Naples, um, Mantua, Milan, um, a few lakes like Lake Garda, Lake Como, um, and Lake Maggiore. What's this one here? Um, they don't go to Venice, though, which she's upset about because there was a recent cholera epidemic, epidemic there. So they were worried about that. Um, and by June, they've made it to Switzerland. Um, this is Geneva that you see in her drawing here. In Switzerland, we again see adventurous Fanny. So this is one of my favorite points in the journey. Um, but events become more somber in her life, and she starts to think and meditate on the importance of her um, relationships with her family. So they travel from Italy to Switzerland, through a place called the Simplon Pass. Um, this is the modern view of that road, but this is the mountainous terrain that she finds herself in at this point in time. Um, there's a thrill, but also a fear of traveling through these mountains. Um, she says they are gloriously skirting awful precipices, riding on Earth's backbone. Um, so soon after this, when they get into Switzerland, their trips to galleries are replaced by nature outings. Um, and Fanny extols the virtues of mountains, waterfalls, and glaciers like she had the Italian Renaissance painters in Italy. Um, I've got here a drawing she did of a glacier that she got to see. They walked on it. Um, she says, peeping down into the awfully deep cracks and crevices that yawn all about and have an azure hue truly ravishing in color. Um, she actually broke out her watercolors again. There's only a few um, images with color in them in her sketchbooks. This is one of them, so she seems to be inspired by it. Um, on more than one occasion, the family decided to hire mules and guides to go into the Swiss mountains, so they climbed mountains. Um, during these excursions, <coughs> Fanny soars. She is thrilled by these experiences. Compares herself to Anne of Geiersee, um, who's a fictional character, also known as the Maiden of the Mist, um, in a book by Sir Walter Scott, you can see here. Um, she is a guide in the Swiss Alps. Um, Fanny wrote down that after going on these treks, she felt like she could run down the State House dome, step over the roofs of the houses in Boston, and then have breakfast in Park Street steeple as a mere advertisement. <laughs> uh, she's also a little afraid of some of the heights as they're going along, but it doesn't seem to stop her. She doesn't like being on a mule, though, as they go down these mountains. It's a little unnerving for her, so she actually gets off, um, picks up a rod, just like this, and then walks down the mountains. Um, she said, seized by iron-shod staff and bound away with great leaps, she beat the rest of the group. Um, the guide praised much my walking, exhilarating air, feel almost a winged mercury in these hills. It took hours to get down. By the end, her knees were trembling. But at night, she dreamed of avalanches and mounting eternally. I guess that's her way of saying hiking. Um, what a day, she says. Um, 
while it seemed that the mountain air was helping the family, and actually William perked up a little bit, um, they checked in with a physician again while they were in Switzerland, and his report was not promising. Um, Fanny wrote on that day that nearly every glimmer of hope of hers was crushed by William's help at that point. Um, they end up finding themselves in um, Thun, Thun, in Switzerland, where a young professor sent them his card of introduction. That's Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. So, this is the first potential time that they meet. Um, Fanny wrote in her journal on that day, I hope the venerable old gentleman won't pop in on us. <laughs> Though I did like Outremer, which was a travel book that he wrote about the first time he went um, to Europe. So Fanny's in luck that day. She doesn't actually meet Henry. He's on his way in the opposite direction. And then he ends up coming back to where they are 11 days later. On July 31st, Fanny finally met Henry. Um, and she comments in her journal that he's a young man after all. <laughs> or else he's the son of the poet. <laughs> so she's not sure. <laughs> At this point, Henry is... Oh, this is the setting where all of this happens. Here's Henry. Um, he's 29 years old. 10 years older than her. Um, almost 10, about my name. And he's been a professor of languages at Bowdoin College in Maine. And he actually goes back to Europe um, to learn more languages and hopes of getting a job here at Harvard. Um, Henry, on the day that they first met, doesn't really write much down. Um, he basically says that he found the Appletons right where he had left them. Um, but he also says, this part's interesting to me, um, that... I just lost it in here. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, a couple days after they first met, Henry says that he finds pleasure again in traveling. Um, up to that point, he wasn't enjoying himself. This is a really difficult period in Henry's life. Um, his wife of the time, her name is Mary Storer Potter, and she's from Portland, Maine, just like him. They've been married for four years. Um, and Nine months previous to this, she passed away from a miscarriage as they're traveling in Europe. Um, so he kind of sets off, leaves the travel companions that he is with at that time, with the Guardian, um, and is continuing his studies, but he is very depressed. And he marks that at this point in time. He says, why do I travel alone? Um, why do I travel at all, basically? This starts to change, though, the more he's spending time with the Appletons. Um, they go on different excursions together. Um, they go on you know, rowing. They go rowing in the lake. They don't actually row themselves. Um, they go to this old tower that you see here and actually climb it. Um, Fanny did a sketch of it that day. They go for <coughs> swims and walks and sketching parties. And in the evenings they have dinner and they share their ideas. Um, this is when Fanny and Henry start talking and spending more time with each other. One evening, she's finishing up her sketches, and she says that Mr. L talked to me all the while about poetry. Shelley, Willis, etc. Um, and she expressed her opinions about Shelley, who she quotes extensively in her journals, but sometimes she doesn't think he's as talented as other people say. Um, this is an image from one of those excursions on the lake. So the people rowing them were actually young women. Um, who can Fanny Collins have very strong arms. <laughs> uh, and this is one of her drawings of the fair rowers of Lake Rience. Um, a couple days after um, they've left this lake area, the Appletons decide they're going to go on another climbing trip up a mountain. Um, I think I've got it here. Yep. So they go up Mount Rigi. They actually see the sunrise up the top of the mountain. Meanwhile, back down by the lake, Henry is spending time with William, because William can't go on this trip. And he writes in his journal um, that he passed the night there with William Appleton, a very interesting young man of the party, slowly sinking with consumption. Henry uses the word, Fanny does not. Um, Henry continued to spend time with them and with family in a period of time that is becoming obvious that she's, she's grieving. Um, 
She's very worried about what's going to happen to her cousin. Um, Fanny is distraught over William's health, um, and Henry is no stranger to death. So I think at this point he's able to be sympathetic um, with her. Um, he has the added benefit of only knowing William for a short period of time, and by this time Henry, William's already accepted his fate. Um, Henry's kindness and attention to William really touches Fanny during this time. Um, at this point, William is too weak to even make his way up the stairs by himself. Um, so he can't take a journey back to Paris, um, to a city where he can find more medical help. And he definitely can't make a voyage back to America. Um, that evening, when the physician told him this, Fanny said that she mingled her tears in her seat. Um, August 15th, she writes that the rushing of the river and the sighing of the trees unstrung me. She was on a walk with Henry that night, and they stayed out um, till the twilight, talking to one another, probably trying to hash through some of what she's experiencing at this point. Two days later, Henry makes an abrupt departure from them. He received a letter from one of his original traveling partners. Her name was um, Clara Crowning Shield. She was a friend of his widow. Um, she has said that she is out of patience, awaiting an escort back to America. So that's where Henry goes. And that's kind of their brief moment together when they first meet. Um, Fanny does write that she's quite sorry to have him go. He had been so kind to William and helped to keep our spirits up. At that point, the journal she would, we have of it, um, of that period in time, ended. It ends on August 21st. Um, the way that she wrote these journals, if you had a chance to come over here, there's a tiny little journal on top of her writing desk. Those are the journals that she actually traveled with and would write down her ideas. Then she came back to America and wrote out everything else in much you know, larger, leather-bound books. Um, this journal over here spans a period in time that isn't covered in the finer journals, the complete ones. Um, so when she came back to America, it seems, for some reason, she decided not to copy what happened in the three months in this journal here. But because we have her sketches, her quick little notes in that little one, um, we know what happens after this point in time. Um, so I'll share with you. The finer one ended at August 21st. On August 24th, William's happy spirit took flight. That's what she says in that little one over there. Um, he would have been 21 in October. He was buried in Schaffhausen in Switzerland, which I believe is where he still is today. Um, at that point, the, the Appletons kind of changed their plan. Um, they wanted to go to Germany to travel up the Rhine. Um, they do that for a little while on their way back to Paris. Um, but by September, both Fanny and Mary are sick. Um, and I can't imagine what their father, Nathan Appleton, is feeling after all of this going on. With so much death in their family so recently. Um, they have gastric fever, is what Fanny calls it, but they recover. Um, and by the time we hit the one year mark, the one year anniversary of their trip, they're back in Paris. Um, she doesn't do many drawings in Paris. <laughs> That's because she's too busy going to balls. She's too busy shopping. Um, she is thrilled to be back in Paris. It feels like coming full circle for her. Um, she, while she's there, is invited to see another head of state, and this time it's King Louis Philippe. I think I've got a picture of him. Oh, skip something. She spends a lot of time with the opera at this point in time. Um, one of the performances that she is thrilled by was by um, this ballerina, Taglioni, um, another amazing um, female performer. She says that she is truly the goddess of the art of ballet. Um, she, they get to know the U.S. minister to France, his name is General Cass, and he is the one who sets up the arrangement to save the king. So here you go. This is King Louis Philippe. Um, it's going to be at another ball. So Fanny gets ready in the evening. Um, she says that roses trimmed my locks and brushed my sleeves. So she has them kind of tucked into the sleeves of her ball gown. Um, she's not as nervous this time, but they do arrive uh, 
way too early for the party. Um, they're still lighting the chandelier, resting on the ground. They haven't even raised it back up in the air. Um, so they have to wait around for a while, then they get in line. They pass by this man, don't say much to the girls, but there is a curtsy and a bow, and then the party happens again. Um, there's a beautiful dinner again that night. This time, though, they dance until 5 in the morning, and they come back to their apartment. Um, so they're having a really glamorous time, you can see. Um, when they leave Paris, finally, they decide to head to Belgium. They also travel through Holland, England, and Scotland. Um, it's a little briefer in this period of time from her journals. Um, one thing is we're still transcribing them, but <laughs> as far as Belgium and Holland, it doesn't seem that Fanny was all too impressed with what she saw. Uh, in Holland, they traveled by train through the lowlands. They went to the, um, the Hague, and they saw Rembrandt paintings. That's pretty much the highlight for her. Um, but upon leaving, uh, upon leaving Holland, this is what she has to say. This is a bit of a tongue twister, so let's see if I can do it. Ducks dabbling in ditches, dribbling damps and dikes, Dank, dirty domiciles, dusty dams, disgusting, dreary dullness, and dolefully drowsy, frothy, drinking dolts of Dutchmen. <laughs> and then they leave. And then they go to England. Oh, there's Holland. So they were there for a little over a month um, in total. And then they go to England. And a lot of what England is for her is hoping that she'll see Princess Victoria. Uh, of going to balls while they're in London, and then traveling into the countryside to see where the Appleton family was from. Um, let's see. They, do, they go to a few of um, the galleries there, too. It looks like they're looking at Dutch artists at this point in time. Um, and they enjoy Regent's Park and Westminster Abbey. She compares it to the Boston Common, so it feels a little bit like home to her. Um, and she's also introduced to women who are participating in politics in England. The way they're doing that is um, with what they buy. So they're convincing tradesmen to join the political party they want them to with what they are purchasing from them. And what Fanny has to say about this, the age of 19, politics, bah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is amusing because we have read her journals as an adult when she was living here. She becomes very passionate about politics here in this country. She's not quite there yet, though. Um, so they do finally see Princess Victoria. Um, and again, this doesn't live up to her romantic vision of what a princess should be. She says, alas for England's future queen. She is a short, thick, commonplace looking girl. <laughs> she doesn't even have a good complexion. <laughs> she did concede, though, that perhaps being plain is a royal distinction. I'm not sure if that's a kind statement either, though. Um, by June, the family gets in the carriages again and starts traveling in the countryside. They went to Little Walding Field, I think I have a sketch of that here, um, to visit Holbrook Hall, which is the home of their ancestors. Um, they're invited to walk around the graveyards, to go into one of the churches. And when they're in the church, she says, how strange a history, thought I that such a space should rear itself between the graves of those of their children, and that we should come as strangers to gaze upon these relics. And she draws the relics that she sees, including um, the Appleton armor here, um, and Appleton crest. There's like a, this is a pineapple that's on it, um, and it's got a helmet. And here is a chest of their wills and the land deeds of what the Appletons owned in this area. So she kind of gets in touch a little bit with her ancestors. They continue traveling in the countryside as far as Scotland, it seems like. Um, they go to Stratford-on-Avon to pay their respects to Shakespeare. Um, they go to Warwick Castle, to Kenilworth, um, to Birmingham, Hardwick Hall, and they travel all over Byron and Wordsworth country. She's quoting as she goes. Um, and while they're traveling, Princess Victoria becomes Queen Victoria. Um, at this point, she has only phrases to say of the Queen. 
Um, but when they come back to London, they have about 10 days before they set sail home. Um, and in that 10 days, they are invited to be presented to Queen Victoria. She and her sister Mary turn it down. <laughs> Their reasoning is that they're afraid it's going to be a dreary affair because everyone will be in mourning clothing for the king. Um, she writes, the crepe trains and bugles, <coughs> an unrelieved lack of dresses, masking the beauty, which is usually, usually resplendent with plumes and jewels, is too much for her to bear. They still go to the party, though. Um, they get tickets, not to be in the room where Queen Victoria is, but to be in the room right outside, so they can watch all the ladies in the finery go by. So their return voyage begins in May, or in May, sorry. They leave from Portsmouth and on the ship to Quebec, um, and they're heading for New York. Fanny says at the end of this journal, thus ends the glorious dream, leaving us with minds and hearts enriched for life, a possession time can never destroy. So already she's anticipating the importance and the weight that this trip will have on her personal life. So if we're trying to figure out what do we learn from Fanny on this trip and what is the legacy of this trip, we're still discovering it for one, but it keeps popping up in places in the house, in her journals. Um, they look back on this trip constantly, both she and Fanny. Um, we know by the end of this trip, Fanny is a woman who has a passion for art and she has seen it around the world now. Um, she loves ballet, poetry, opera, drawing and painting. Um, she's a woman who values intelligence and good conversation and education, um, but do who doesn't necessarily want to be politically involved as a 19-year-old. Um, she's a woman who understands the preciousness of life and she values her relationships with her family and close friends differently after this trip, maybe more deeply. Um, she's a woman who finds God's inspiration all around her in music she hears, in artwork, in nature too. And she is a Boston socialite who now has the bragging rights of seeing and or meeting three heads of state. So that's pretty cool. Uh, but what I have up here is one of the pieces of legacy that hits my heart. This is one of her sketchbooks that she had on that trip. So you can see her initials here. Um, and it's filled with the artwork that you've seen that's on the wall today. And she gave this to Henry when the two of them finally got married. And there's an interesting inscription on it. It says, from Mary Ashburton to Paul Fleming. Mm -hmm. This is referring to a book that Henry wrote after they first met called Hyperion, in which the main character, this guy, Paul Fleming, is obviously him. And there's a young woman, um, a dark-haired beauty, who falls madly in love with him. <coughs> That didn't quite happen with Fanny and Henry. Their courtship is about seven years long. Um, at first, Fanny is mortified by this book coming out, saying that that's not her. She writes letters to people all the way to Cincinnati saying, I am not interested in Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Um, but after seven years, it seems like, even if this is a little tongue in cheek, she came around and she gives this to him as a wedding present. Her daughters will read her journals. Um, when her daughters travel in Europe, one of them actually carries her travel writing desk, which you can see over there. Annie brought that with her, and when we received this from one of Longfellow's descendants, it was filled with Annie's letters. So we're still finding really what the reach is of this trip. Mm -hmm. All right. There are a lot of things in the house that connect with it. This was, you know, two years grand tour in a very quick time. Um, if you, we have sparked your interest at all, what I encourage you to do is travel with us. Um, over the next two years, at least, we are going to be writing um, the research that we do um, and diving in really deep with her stories, reading what she has to say, and then sharing it with you on a blog. The address of it is right here. Today marks the first day of our post, because if you remember, this is the day they finally got out of New York Harbor. Um, I'm going to come back to this in just a moment. I'll leave it up. But I do want to show you that blog. This is hard to do back.
backwards, sorry. So here she is, Fanny Sets Sale. Um, again, if you want the address, you can just type in longnps.wordpress.com and you can travel with us as we go. We'll be including her sketches even more than we were able to share with you tonight. Um, all of that is part of our year-long celebration of her. You can look here, you can look on our Facebook page, you can also sign up for our newsletter on the clipboard in the back. If you want to hear what else we're doing to celebrate Fanny and her life over the next year. So with that, thank you. If you have any questions, I would love to answer them. Was of it's, it looked to me like Tinder Abbey um, mm -hmm. it, for, that you used for the England. Yeah, we have England up on the screen, but so she visits a lot of different ab abbeys as they're traveling around in the countryside. Let me get to this real quick and see if we can read the inscription on that one in particular. Can you repeat the one that you brought up? You, it was when, when you have the you had the label mm -hmm. England. And what did it remind there, you of? There, there. Yeah. 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 Oh, what does that say? Picky? Yeah. 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 And a place? Nikki? Netley? 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 Abby's not Abby. Yeah, it could be Netley. Oh, that does look like an N. Netley yeah. Abby. Yeah. I'd love to get you more information about that one. She does take a second trip back to um, England to see her sister who's living there at that point. Um, and there are more Abbey sketches on the wall that we have from that bed <coughs> later on in the 40s, 1840s. So there is an Abbey. Netley Abbey. Yeah. Sounds like a good possibility. <laughs> Don't tell me near Netley. <laughs> <laughs> near Southampton in Hampshire. Doesn't tell me. Near either. Southampton? Mm -hmm. Down on the coast? Southampton, you know. Mm -hmm. huh. well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Look like most like Was the Paris sketch her own, or was that something, someone else's? That was someone else's, okay. yeah. Um, when she's in the cities, she's not sketching as much, so I don't have anything from when she was in Paris. Yeah. I, I haven't read Hyperion yet. Uh, do the, are the, does the couple get together in that group? I haven't read it all the way. No, they, they don't. <laughs> they don't. Yeah. Maybe she should totally inject some of Hyperion. Oh, that sounds a little more That's like the exactly. real story, huh? <laughs> what is more like a real story? In Hyperion, um, she ends up rejecting oh, he's, he's Paul's money, it that's sounds that's like. That's the major thrust. He's just, uh -huh. She's rejecting him. He's just described. Yeah, yeah. which is more that's what he was experiencing. That's published in 1989, so it's another four years before they mm -hmm. get together. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. And you can get the full text of that online. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's, it really reads very, very, very nice. Mm -hmm. It gives a mm -hmm. wonderful description of a woman when he sees her for the first time, yeah. and that's Fanny for sure. It's yeah. really, really wonderful, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it must be personal letters, right? So between the two of them. Yeah. There's um, hardly any correspondence between them. Between no. and when Fanny they, and when she finally yeah. accepts his proposal later on, <laughs> is when we have a few things. There seems to be some gaps. There's a, a letter that she. He writes her, but I haven't been able to track down, and she responds saying yes to his proposal. Um, so it's, some of them are missing, yeah, as far as I know. Do you know any more of that case? We have that evidence. We, the, the evidence around how their courtship actually happens yeah, is so scant. Mm -hmm. um, either it didn't survive or they were only across the river, um, Boston to Cambridge. They weren't leaving records. In one of those letters, Fanny does talk about wanting to start anew with their relationships. So, yeah, that's I don't know if there's an effort to not look at the past as much. In, in any of the letters, 
they're not specifically these, but any, do they talk more about willing and dying and why the decision was made to bury him there when in fact Mary Instead of bringing Potter him home. was like I was wondering the same thing. Um, there's a lot more still for me to read. Oh. So um, as just kind of a bigger broad picture, we have 43% of the travel <coughs> journals, there are six of them, um, transcribed. I haven't done any of the translations yet myself. I'm going to dive into that soon. So there's still a lot more to look at and other people's perspectives. But as far as Fanny, it's an occasional line where she talks about what William is experiencing oh. and how his health is deteriorating oh. over time. I imagine Nathan is sending letters back to his father mm -hmm. back here in Boston. But I don't know where those are okay. or what they say. I want you that very journal that you were quoting, where she's just yeah, describing yes. the journey of the Francis de Paul. Yeah. And they delay a day mm -hmm. departure. And Willie's father, which, which is Nathan's brother, comes mm -hmm. down. And he's distraught. He's in tears because Willie is dying. And I think even the father. But one of the reasons they make the trip is to bring him along yeah. with hopes that he'll revive. But we were wondering if he was sick beforehand. Oh, he was. I think yeah. that's one of, the reasons that, like, one of the reasons they was, travel was always prescribed as. Something that would, mm -hmm. they hoped would help uh, help you with uh, consumption. And mm -hmm. so many people die of consumption of these uh, the apples that the long fall. It's just amazing. Their mother, Fanny's mother dies, yeah. her brother dies, Henry's sister dies. It's, yeah, it's, it's well, but it was contagious. <laughs> but some people get it and some people well, I know, but still it's, they were all, all around. Yeah. 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 Yes, how was it that Fanny's sister uh, ends up living in so she marries an Englishman um, and ends up back, living back there um, for a little while. She leaves Boston and then goes to <coughs> D.C. and then they end up back in England. Um, so she's you know, separated from her sister, who's one of her really close friends. Um, you can see that in Fanny's letter, she misses her sister. And pretty soon after um, they leave and go to England, Fanny decides to go back and visit her. How many languages could Fanny speak? Was she able to converse with the locals? Yeah, you know, to the extent of how fluent she is, I don't know if I can speak to that. Um, there's a lot of French in her journals. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's the one she's the most comfortable in. She also picks up Italian and would sprinkle that in. I don't know if it translates off the page, if she's conversational or not, I can't really say. Um, and then Henry actually tries to teach her German for a little while. I'm not sure how into that she is, but she has very strong opinions that German is not a language that sounds good to her. Yeah. Well, again, mm -hmm. when, when they're together in Switzerland and, mm -hmm. they're, and they're reciting poems to each other, yeah. and they are they are tr translating a poem from the German into English, mm -hmm. and then later when, when he publishes carriage, that, yeah. he tells her that her translation is better than his. Oh, and, and, and that's actually a <laughs> professor who teaches German. So, so the ger her German must be pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. A nice act of courtship in any case. <laughs> 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 or just being nice. one point of being very <laughs> persuasive. <laughs> Don't forget, her teacher for German was Franz Liebler, too. Yeah. Her, her father, I had Liebler, was a teacher. And uh, that's pretty important. I need to get you in a room and talk to her. <laughs> 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 who, who is Liebler? Francis Liebler. Yeah, you have to Google him. He's a very, very, very important man who uh, becomes a professor or a counselor to the president. He becomes an authority in the Civil War, very close to Sumner. Mm -hmm. and, and he's a, he comes to this country from Germany. He starts tutoring the children of very wealthy people. And, yeah. uh, and he's up at the Athenaeum. And he's, he gets terribly with the uh, Appleton family. And then he, he really just takes a great liking to the Appleton girls, both Mary mm -hmm. and Fanny. And, and, and it's a lifelong friendship. It's a wonderful correspondence. Uh -huh. We have his letters here. I think the originals are up mm -hmm. Fabulous letters. Mm -hmm. Lieber, L-I-E-B. Yeah, that's... Um, just, just, just Google it. 